Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. With that, let's see who our guest is today and what experience and advice they have to offer you to improve your own operation. All right, Wes. Well, thank you for joining me on the show today. It's great to have you on here and to share your story with my listeners. I know we've been able to chat a little bit kind of briefly over email and a phone call here and there, but to start off um, and to introduce yourself, would you talk about your background in agriculture and what that looks like today? Yeah, Shay. Thanks for having us. Um, So I'm originally from Kentucky. I grew up on a I mean, I'd be the fourth generation on that farm before I actually moved west. Um, got a degree from an ag econ from University of Kentucky. Went to work for the Charlotte Association for six years as a territory manager in Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma and Louisiana. And then uh, I've been with Gallagher since 2015 as a territory manager in Missouri. Okay, so then, you know, today to preface this for the audience, you know, we're going to be talking about some rotational grazing and whatnot. So as you work with Gallagher, how, how does your role with Gallagher tie into helping producers with rotational grazing or your knowledge base there? So um, since I've been with Gallagher, it's been really good. And it's been incredibly interesting to see how that has evolved from when I was young. And we, you know, there's been quite a bit of rotational grazing done in Kentucky for a long time. And then when I got to go to Texas to see how they kind of adapted it to their needs and then now here, but it just seems like it's a a technology and a practice that just keeps evolving. Um, You know, with Gallagher, I kind of feel like my role is to help producers, um, both by educating where, you know, their, where they go and buy products, educating the staff there, as well as educating the actual consumer, the guy on the ranch, um, different techniques I've seen, different things, um, and there's always different ways of doing things, and it's kind of neat to go different places and see how other people are doing it. Well, absolutely, and that's something that we talk about a lot on this show is there's more than one way to um, achieve your result, to achieve success on your ranch. So what in your territory, what states are those? How big is that? What does that look like? So I cover all the state of Missouri, and then I cover southern Illinois. So, um, you know, with Missouri, we've got a very diverse state. Um, The north part of the state does a lot of row crop, a lot of agronomy based ag. And the southern part of the state is very much cow calf oriented. Um, It's a little rougher topography, got the hills and hollers. And so it's a little more suited for cattle production. So now this might be a little bit of a loaded question because you already said you run a diverse territory, but what are some of those challenges that producers in your territory face when it comes to the grazing side of things? So the biggest challenge just right out the bat is fescue. I mean, it's dominant in my state all from top to bottom um, and managing that, even though it is a wonderful uh, grass and can be great to have, it does come with its own management challenges, but uh, that's one of the biggest things. But the other side of it is from north to south, we struggle with, you know, different types of grass, different soil quality. Northern Missouri, I mean, I think you could get a drop of rain and grow something there. The soils are so good, but you get into southern Missouri, there's a lot of rock. And so the challenges that go with not only, you know, what grasses thrive there, but what products we can use to even put in the ground. I mean, it's hard to step a post in if it's on solid rock. Do you want to dive deeper into some of those challenges that fescue is creating for people in that area? Yeah, and it's it's pretty widespread. I think anybody that's ever had fescue on the ranch or on the farm understand that, you know, it requires a little more management. Um, what I think I'm pretty heartened to see here is guys are 
kind of going back to some of the native grasses of Missouri. They're going back and they're looking at why if something was here before we decided to remove it. And I saw that happening in Texas when I left down there too. Those guys were looking at native grasses and how they could um, go back a little more to what thrive there naturally. But there's a lot more focus being put on um, cool season grasses, warm season grasses, and trying to introduce some more variety into their uh, pastures and grazing systems. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, you never heard of anybody grazing turnips or grazing carrots. And now it's just kind of part of it. I mean, everybody just kind of accepts it and it's, you know, and the guys that do that have seen a lot of success. Yeah, that is something, you know, grazing has been talked about a fair amount on this show. And with my um, animal science degree, that's something that was touched on there too. So we're going to stay on the fescue topic a little bit. Now, from a rotational grazing standpoint, what do some of those strategies look like as far as managing that fescue? You talked about trying to bring back some of those native grasses. So what are those some of those specific strategies that you see farmers and ranchers implementing on their operations to control that fescue and bring some of those native grasses back? What, what are you seeing people doing that's been working? So what I think is a lot of guys have had some, some success with is uh, they've been able to, you know, implement and add, add, you know, like we'll say with warm season grasses, that's when fescue really kind of goes dormant and it's kind of a, a struggle to deal with. You're not getting a lot out of it, but the biggest problem with it, with fescue is once it kind of gets stemmy, cattle don't want to eat it. It's a rough, you know, very coarse plant. So they'll immediately try to eat everything else around it. So as long as those guys, if they're doing a rotational grazing and they're doing one that's very highly managed, you know, they're moving cattle frequently, they're able to keep ahead of that and keep that fescue eat down where it doesn't ever really get stemmy. It doesn't really get coarse. Um, and then, you know, they introduce in the summertime here, we have a lot of clover, which brings some other challenges with it as well, like bloat. But it is a, you know, you add that in with the mix and it does a good job for them. And then when you get into fall, I mean, there's hard to beat that stockpiled fescue and more guys, you know, it's a lot cheaper to let the cow eat the grass than it is to, uh, you know, cut it and bale it. So, you know, the stockpile of the fescue and putting it back and reserving it for later has become real popular as well. Okay. So you talked about, you know, adding the clover into the mix, So are you seeing a lot of people kind of trying to replant some of those grazing grounds with more native mixes or what are you seeing on that front? Or are they using more just grazing strategies in general to shift um, the plant communities? I think you're seeing just a shift, um, but there is, I mean, there's quite a few people that have, that have latched onto the idea of the native grasses and just trying to find that balance. Um, but you see on the other side of the coin, there's a lot of guys that they'd rather burn all the clover out of the field and they don't want to see it anymore. Um, so it's, like you said earlier, I mean, it's what works for you. Um, the, uh, the guys that are really serious about it, that are really looking at the dollars and cents and the bottom line are trying to figure out how to manage and, you know, maintain what they've got without adding extra chemicals, without extra work, without extra time through the field with diesel, the cost that it is now. Yeah, that, that extra fuel cost is really a burden for a lot of people right now. <laughs> yep, that is correct. So you made the comment about, you know, one part of managing fescue was a little more having a higher management or maybe a higher intensity grazing system where you're moving more frequently. Are you seeing individuals do that with permanent paddocks and permanent fence, or do you recommend more like the temporary fence all the time? Because I know there are a lot of varying opinions on that, and it does depend on, you know, how diverse your operation is in itself and where you're at from a labor standpoint. So what are you seeing from the fencing aspect of it, and what do you kind of recommend? So I'll start with the back side of the question and work my way forward. You know, as far as a recommendation, I tell everybody you need to do what works best for you. Um, I've got some customers I've dealt with over the years. I've got a gentleman in Southeast Missouri. He, uh, his big, I guess the core of his operation is he actually finishes out um, uh, dairy heifers and he moves them every hour. Um, but he's retired. He's 65, 70 years old. And that's what he does every day. And he thoroughly enjoys going out there to it and doing it. 
But on the other side of that coin, you know, we've got guys that move them every week. Um, so it really is just, you know, what your time allows for, you know, your management to be. Um, moving into that question a little deeper, I mean, you know, we see a lot of guys that, you know, a handful of years ago, there was a lot of permanent fence construction being done, guys that were building those permanent pads, permanent paddocks, pastures, however you want to say it, and moving them through those. And then now it seems like we've seen more of a shift towards, um, and then it was more about maintaining the cow. Now we've seen more of a shift towards the temporary fence, um, having a totally fluid system, um, not even a permanent watering point. I mean, being able to move everything as the grass, you know, allows, as the grass demands, and really chasing that forage to utilize it the best. Now, with some of these questions, you have varying operations, but so in the summer, which would be your more traditional breeding season for a lot of producers. Um, do you see, you know, having different breeding groups and bulls in different pastures holding people back from doing rotational grazing? Um, what do you see on that front? Because especially on your seed stock side, you're going to have cows pretty strategically split up for that natural service cleanup bull or whatever sire group they're in. So what are you seeing happen on that front as far as grazing? So my background is actually uh, purebred cattle. I mean, I grew up on a Charlotte and Angus operation. And that's what I've always done and known. And I do think that that is a challenge. Um, those guys that are trying to really do the intensive grazing, they struggle with being able to have, you know, the cows with the right bull or, you know, how many bulls do they have to have to try to keep that set of cows the right number to move through the forages. And then, and with that, I would say that, you know, your commercial guys that, you know, have a lot more freedom of what they're doing, you'll see a lot more of the intensive grazing on those style of operations. The guys that with purebred cattle, they seem to be doing a lot more AI work if they're going to try to do that intensive grazing. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. So we've kind of talked about the fescue part, but earlier in the show, you brought to light how other parts of Missouri are a lot drier compared to, say, your northern part. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those grazing challenges you see obviously if it's drier you're going to have lower forage production etc but on the rotational grazing side you know how is that being implemented in those drier more arid environments so when you get kind of like the south central southwest missouri those parts of the world um your carrying capacity goes down a lot more so your ability to you know turn those cows out and mob graze is a little more challenging because your pads are going to have to be that much bigger. Um, what those guys down there have done, and that's really in all of my state, that's where I do probably the most intensive grazing work. Those guys down there really adopted it to try to get the best out of what they can. Um, and they're really kind of on the forefront of, you know, stockpiling for fall and chasing some of those warm season grasses and going back to the more native grasses as well. Um, that are adapted to that climate, adapted to those soil types. Um, and it's really kind of interesting when those guys down there, like this year with the cost of fescue seed being what it is, those guys are actually uh, combining a lot of fescue and several of the seed companies in that part of the world, you know, that's their big deal is that that seed is native. It's from this part of the world. If you plant it, you know, it's, it's acclimated and climatized to where you're putting it. Well, thank you for sharing that. So, Kind of looking at tools to make fencing easier. Um, are there, is there anything specific that you recommend to, you know, take some ease off of, you know, if you are doing that temporary fence, um, what do you recommend there to make the fencing side of things easier if you're moving fence a lot and shifting pastures? So without a doubt, the number one thing is a geared reel. I mean, if you have a geared reel, it will save you hours of time. Um, whether you're just transporting your fence or whether you're moving it constantly. I mean, a geared reel, I mean, I would, I can't even imagine trying to operate without one. Um, you know, a standard reel that doesn't, re that doesn't have that three to one gear ratio. I mean, it's a good tool, but man, it's a lot nicer being able to turn the wheel one time and make it turn three times. Well, thank you for sharing that. So Looking at, um, you talked about how some producers manage, you know, making sure there's water sources as they move pastures, but what other solutions are you seeing there as far as um, maybe the most efficient method 
uh, moving water systems or making sure there are water systems as you rotationally graze on those more intensive units? So, like I said, you know, in the past, it was a little more of that permanent setup. Um, and I still think, you know, to some extent, the water is still somewhat permanent in most people's setups, no matter what they've changed to or what, if they've made any, you know, progression on their grazing systems. But we are seeing a lot more guys that are willing to, um, you know, pull water lines above ground and put out stock tanks with floats and go that route to truly chase that grass the way it needs to be. Um, and you see more of that than you ever did before. Um, but there's still, I would still say, you know, of the water tanks that I sell, most of them are going into a permanent system and guys are, you know, putting a water tank and then building that grazing system around it. Okay. So we've touched on the kind of some of the forage quality standpoint and shifting those plant communities through grazing, but what are some other benefits that your producers are seeing or the people you work with are seeing as they implement rotational grazing? Oh, without a doubt, it's the bottom line. You know, you're maximizing your profits and trying to lower that overhead and lower that feed cost. Um, I think that's more, I think that's the driver behind, you know, people that are doing more of it and guys that are, you know, starting to get into it. I think it's all about, you know, the cost of production and with everything that's went up here in the last couple of years. I mean, I think that's becoming more and more important. Uh, if you can lower your feed costs, if you can lower, you know, trips through the field with a tractor and a baler just by stockpiling, I think that's really kind of shocked people what kind of dollars they can save. All right. Well, Wes, is there anything else you'd like to share or add? Um, just mention to the audience, you know, any last thoughts? Yeah. Uh, as far as grazing goes, like we've talked, I mean, you know, you need to do what works best for you, but I just, you know, suggest to anybody, just try it. I mean, get out there. It's, it's not rocket science. There's all kinds of information out there, you know, available on the internet. Um, you can go to the Gallagher's website. We've got a lot of good articles there. Um, you can find your local rep and they would be more than happy to help you set up a system and talk to you about it. But I would just, you know, get out there and try it. All righty. Well, thank you for being on the show today. I appreciate you sharing all your insight, knowledge, and experience with the audience today. Yep. Thank you guys for having us. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day.